Welcome to the Top Advisor Marketing Podcast brought to you by Proudmouth. I'm your host, Matt Halloran. Being your own loud is not new to marketing, but the mindset, strategies, and resources to help you get there are evolving faster than this industry is keeping up. It is time to find a new perspective on what works why and how to move your business forward. Listen as I interview guests to help you learn from them how to be your own loud. Let's get to the show. Hello and welcome to another Top Advisor Marketing Podcast. This is Matt Halloran. Today, we are going to talk about the power of outsourcing, but most importantly, really how to work smarter, not harder. So we've had a couple of people who've worked in the world of compliance on the podcast, but what Max does is a little bit different. So our guest today is uh, Max Schatzo. He's an attorney at Stark and Stark, but he is the founder of advisorcouncil.net. Now, when you get off the podcast, make sure you go to the show notes because we are going to give you the link to advisorcouncil.net. I cannot stress this enough. You in financial services, you have to subscribe to this blog. It is a magnificent opportunity for you to keep your fingers on the pulse of what's going on in, in from the SEC reg- regulations that have recently come out, plus some other stuff too. So, And Max is the founder of that and the, the main writer. So Max, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. The idea here of working smarter, not harder, is something that I think that there's a great business coaching consultant. His name is Dan Sullivan. And he says, you have to focus on who, not how. And I believe that you should be the who solution for a lot of this. Why don't you talk a little bit about your history on how you got into this insanity that you now live in? And two, let's talk a little bit about some of the stuff that you guys do. I am an attorney with the law firm of Stark and Stark. And as Matt noted, you know, I also author and, and, you know, the host of the blog advisorcouncil.net. And I got into this industry, you know, basically fresh out of law school. I first practiced securities law, working with small companies going public. But then I slowly transitioned to this world of investment advisory, investment management counseling, just because there was so much demand for the, you know, for good counsel at affordable rates in this area, right? The counsel to companies like JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, they charge $2,000 an hour for time for an attorney. Most smaller advisors, you know, one, two, three, five person firms just cannot afford those rates and, and really, you know, grow their business and be financially, you know, in a great position business-wise. I saw this great void and, you know, so did my colleagues and we've really latched on and taken advantage of it. What does all of that mean though, right? If I'm a regular run-of-the-mill Main Street financial advisor, what are you going to do for me that that maybe like my broker dealer's not going to do because you know, I think the biggest issue that a lot of people have with compliance is it's for the lowest common denominator, right? It's not for really who's out there. It's for the schmucks who pull the crap that they're not supposed to pull. Help me with that. Yeah, great, great points. And I, I think we we help by crafting compliance programs and crafting business models that work for our clients, right? Our typical client is someone who has left a broker dealer, a wire house, a large RIA, and wants to start their own business. You know, someone who wants to get registered as an investment advisor, and they don't want to deal with all the unnecessary burdensome compliance at their former firm. We can help streamline their business to run smoothly, to run efficiently, and not really get bogged down by compliance, but still be a compliant business. And that's where our value comes in. That was a Freaking brilliant statement there. I love that. Not being bogged down by compliance, but still being compliant. And I think, Max, that's what everybody wants, brother, right? That's that's really, truly, and, and especially when people are leaving wirehouses or they're truly going independent, the RIA world, that's the reason I have found that the majority of them do it. It's not just because of payouts. It's really so that they have the freedom to say what they need to say. How do you do it, though, man? Like, how do you, one you got to build a lot of trust, Max, because I mean, these are people who are leaving, let's say that they're leaving one of the big wire houses. They're going to start their own RIAs. This is the freaking wild west, brother. And everybody's coming to them because you know this, Max, there's all sorts of people saying, you need this, you need this, you need this. How do you guys 
build that trust so that they understand that I can trust them to make it so that I'm compliant, but not burdened with compliance? Really good question. I think the reality is, and, and the biggest comment I hear from clients and prospective clients is, we don't know what we don't know. Right. We are that expert. You know, we live in this area. We study the law. We study the guidance the SEC is putting out there. We study the guidance FINRA and state securities bureaus are putting out there. And we keep a pulse on it. I don't know if every compliance consultant or every vendor in this area can say that, but we truly do. And that's somewhere where, you know, where we add value because we know what is required. We know what is simply just a best practice or what everyone else is doing. And we can tell you what specifically you need to be doing to be compliant. And then we can coach you on those things that you might want to do or not want to do that aren't necessarily required. And so there's some flexibility. We help fill the grayness there. Your ideal client is our ideal client, which is one of the reasons why I really loved having you on the show, because we're really talking to the same people here, right? A lot of people want to do podcasting. A lot of people want to have content marketing, but they're burdened by the compliance companies that they work with, the bigger firms. And so they want to have the opportunity because they know they're not going to be saying things that they're not going to talk about. So let's talk about compliance. Let's talk about how do you build a program for people so they can do, they can work with somebody like us, right? Because you know what we do. We've already had a couple of conversations, right? So we we do the podcasting and we create social media assets. We post on their behalf. We make sure that we have transcripts so that everybody has the filings or the what they need to have for audits if they need them. How do you help craft infrastructure so that they can execute what we do and and kind of just be a little bit less stressed about it? Every one of our clients is a little bit different depending on how experienced they are, how large they are, and how comfortable they are with compliance. I think we can offer as much or as little handholding throughout this process as they want or need. In terms of like the fullest, deepest need, we can help clients review scripts, review podcasts, approve them, edit them, make sure they're, you know, they're fully compliant and won't get them in any trouble. Or we can sort of just give them the tools and give them the know-how on, on things they should say, should not say, what they should avoid, you know, and give them some ground rules and let them just operate within that framework. Every client's different and, and we work through that. I love guardrails, brother. That that to me is like the one thing that where major uh, companies have really failed is because they're not guardrails, they're handcuffs, right? And and you guys give them the guardrails so that they can still navigate because most of the people that we work with specifically, Max, they're not going to be saying the stuff they're not supposed to say because number one, it's, it's not honest. In fact, you just posted something. And I'm going to hearken to something that you just recently posted on your blog, the advisor council.net talking about the new SEC ruling and talking about honesty. Would you mind just talking just a little bit about what you had written there? Because I thought it was really insightful and a little bit different of a take than I think people are looking at when it comes to testimonial specifically. Sure. So the, you know, I think what you're referring to is that the new advertising and marketing rule, which I just want to make clear is not yet effective. It's still sort of in this pending period. The new rule will have these principle based requirements to, to sort of review or make sure that an advertisement is not false or misleading. And one of those sort of principles is this concept that something can't give a false inference or a misleading inference. And I think that's kind of the law, the lay of the law today, right? You know, you, you can't create this unfair inference. You can't promise returns. You can't guarantee returns. All these things that most financial professionals are already very well aware of, right? Especially the ones who, who are mindful of these things. Mm -hmm. I think there's, there's just a lot of, there's a lot that goes into understanding a new rule and we'll, we'll start working through those details with our clients. But you know, I think that sort of gives you a, an idea of what we're talking about. And especially, so if you have one of your clients come on and you're going to do a testimonial, right? One of the neat things about the new ruling or the one that's going to take effect whenever the heck it takes effect, if you're paid for it, right? Or if you're providing any sort of compensation, you have to be upfront with that, which I think is going to hopefully make it so that a lot of people don't ever do that. Cause how terrible of a commercial would that be, dude? Oh, by the way, I just gave this person $10,000 to say how freaking awesome I am, right? That, that's going to nerf that pretty bad. But you know, I don't think that a lot of your clients and a lot of our clients, especially people who are RIAs, 
they're very financial planning focused, right? So, so those are the kind of people, and they don't want to talk about returns. They want to talk about your goals and your plan and those sorts of things. And if you have a client who came on who said, well, oh my God, my advisor killed it last year and gave me a 14% rate of return. Well, you're just not going to publish the damn thing, right? You're going to say, no, 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 we can't use that because you know that's that's you know somewhat promissory. What your portfolio looks like isn't necessarily what other people's portfolio looks like. We have a third party money manager that, that we interview all the time who has a podcast with us. And it's it's fantastic to me how he navigates the performance because that's a huge component of his value prop, right? And he will say all the time, look, because he talks about individual equities, which is very interesting because the performance of an individual equity is written, right? It's not the portfolio. He will talk specifically about, I don't, I don't know, I'd, I'd make something up. X stock has been up 12%. Well, you can freaking look that up, right? But if you said the overall portfolio was up 40%, that's where things get nebulous. So I just wanted to highlight there that there are ways to navigate this. Now, do you guys have, do you have anything that is maybe a little bit more cookie cutter? You guys have done this so many times. Do you have something that somebody says, you know, hey, Max, I, I don't necessarily, since I'm a small or I don't have the budget or whatever. Do you have something that's a little, that's kind of plug and play-ish for people or, or do you not do that and you want to do the customization? We sort of can do both, right? I mean, we, we have sort of stock template compliance manuals for clients and we can help them get registered in a really cost-effective way. It, it all depends on facts and circumstances and what our client is you know, looking for. I would say, you know, our preferred client though is someone who is, who is willing to spend the time, money, and energy to build a compliance program around their business model. That's our preferred client. Gotcha. As you started answering that question, I was thinking to myself, that's a very lawyery answer right there. But then you got really specific, dude. And that made me really happy because our audience really truly wants to connect with you, right? They want to know who you are and if they're an ideal client for you. And that was very, very well said. And, and I like the fact that you guys, because there are other companies, just full disclosure, we've had them on the podcast before, who have compliance in a box. In fact, that's actually part of their name. Um, it's not compliance in a box, but I think you guys might know who I'm talking about. I love the fact that you guys want to work with something a little bit more in depth that's customized to truly get the voice and the, the long term compliance goals of your clients. What are some of the biggest things that you're seeing right now that are obstacles from a an RIA overall compliance world that you have been navigating recently that you'd like our clients to know our listeners to know about? There, there's two things that come to mind that the SEC staff and the Division of Ex Department Examinations are really focused on these days. They've been focused on this first one for quite some time now. And that's this idea of share class selection for mutual funds. And by that, we mean there's multiple, and Matt, I don't know how familiar you are with the nuances of mutual funds, but there's many different share classes in a specific mutual fund. And they all have different sort of you know, benefits or costs or expense ratios. As a fiduciary, investment advisors are expected to select the most appropriate or the best share class for their clients. And so the SEC has been really focused on advisors who have either intentionally or negligently selected a more expensive share class when a less expensive share class has been available. They are going through, you know, and examining advisors across the country and really digging into this issue. And in certain instances, they're actually requiring these advisors to reimburse their clients for this decision if it turns out they were negligent or intentionally selecting the wrong share class. All right, hold on. Before you get to number two, I got to poke you in the eye about this because this drives me a little bit crazy. Why is compensation such a huge aspect of compliance? So if I choose a more expensive mutual fund, I'm I'm assuming that there has to be some reason. Does it have better protections? Does it have better communication? I mean, how do you suss that stuff out? Because it's not just cost. We can't all just go to a low cost ETF and maybe that's what they're pushing for. I don't know, dude, help me with that. Yeah, no. So we're talking about share classes, which are part of the same exact fund, right? So the, ah. the, the management, the holdings, the strategy are all identical. 
there truly is no difference other than cost. Okay. There, there really is a, you know, a good argument here by the staff and, and really digging into the details here. There are some dynamics that differ on share classes like transaction fees that might make sense and might reduce the expense ratio, but you're paying transaction fees and vice versa. So there, there's a lot of nuance here, but the takeaway for your listeners should be, you really got to be thoughtful in your selection. You got to be thoughtful in your review of client portfolios. If they are holding this more expensive share class, make sure you you can justify the reason why they're holding it. Gotcha. Um, you know, that would be my big takeaway. Okay. What's the second one? The second one is advertising. I mean, <laughs> and, that, and that's an area that is near and dear to your heart, right? Yeah. They do spend a lot of time reviewing these, but m- mostly performance advertising, right? You know, when you're talking about performance figures and you're talking about hypothetical performance, back-tested performance, there's a huge, huge focus by the staff on those things. Run-of-the-mill social media podcasts where we're just talking about our firm, our employees, our culture, our model, those kind of things are are relatively low risk. And so I, you know, I'm not trying to scare away your audience here from, from, from doing those things, but just be mindful of, you know, the, the performance advertising issues. And, and that's not our ideal client either. The last thing in the world that I want to do is, is to have somebody who comes on a podcast and all they do is talk about performance. But, but you said something there that, that really struck me. And, and I, I don't know how to ask this, so please bear with, this might be a longer lead into a question. But when advisors have clients come in and they're, they do the uh, second opinion, right? Let me stress test your portfolio or let me see how much risk you have in your portfolio ba- based off of whatever your risk tolerance is. Almost everybody uses a Monte Carlo simulation, right? How is that compliant? I, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a hypothetical situation, but they're not positioning it. They'll say it's hypothetical, but they're really truly not positioning that as hypothetical. Does that make sense? I think I understand what you're saying. And I, I think if you if you read the disclosures on these stress tests or these Monte Carlos, especially if you're using a big provider like Morningstar right. or, a, or a hidden levers or Riskalyze, I, I mean, those software but you know platforms include some built-in disclosures on those very points. I think the disclosures themselves, at least as the rules currently exist, are probably sufficient to avoid misleading clients. I don't agree. I'm going to flat out not agree with you on this, dude, because it's so easy to manipulate that. I, now, now, risk is I'm not. I'm actually going to put them in a different category. Uh, but like Morningstar, okay, brother. So Morningstar, everybody uses that stuff for BlackRock or blah blah blah. All these different companies, and and you know, so they'll say, okay, here's your portfolio. Now, if you invested with us in our process, this is what you would have. But but it, that's totally suspect, in in my opinion, of of first off, promissory. I think that's that totally is not compliant, and two. It's not real, man. It's just so not real. So do they need to rewrite this? I'm putting you on the spot. No, no, no. I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you. So I think I was talking about two different things. I was talking specifically about like asset allocation Monte Carlos that are trying to project outcomes. We're just looking at, you know, will you be able to retire if, you know, we make 6% estimates? Can we reach your goals? What you're talking about is truly hypothetical back-tested performance based on some model portfolio or a hypothetical portfolio. And that is absolutely an issue of focus for the SEC staff. I think that there is a high likelihood to mislead or or manipulate the data there. And so the SEC staff is well aware of those issues and, and they are focused on them, trust me. Thank you for, for letting me challenge you on that. That, that was, but, but here's the fun part, everybody who's listening is this. Max knows his stuff, dude. Like uh, we didn't prepare for any of this. You know, he was able to answer that off the cuff with, with, with passion, with expertise and understanding of the main differences between those two. And I'm glad that, you know, the SEC and and the regulatory bodies are really looking at that, which brings me to my, my final question before I, I kind of wrap this stuff up, which is the idea of risk. Okay. From a compliance standpoint, How do you help people create, whether it's an investment policy statement or, or, or how do you help people 
document the risk of their clients so that they're that they're compliant and covered. That's that's one of our big sort of selling points and and where we help our clients, right? I mean, we're not just focused on regulation. We are focused on managing risk from beginning to end, registration all the way to winding down your affairs some future date. We help clients with all those things, right? Creating investment policy statements that work, creating investment advisory agreements that work. We try and match your management style, your management philosophies and strategies back to your agreement, back to your IPS, and make sure you know that your disclosures also align with these things in your form ADV or any sort of prospectus or any other kind of document that you might need as an investment advisor. We truly believe that our value is in those additional things. What should I have asked you that I didn't? Did I miss something? I don't think so. I mean, I think you, you know, the the questions you've asked have covered a a broad array of what we do and who we are. If there's anything else that I can share with you about me as a person or, you know, our law firm, I'd be happy to. Let's let's wrap up with that, brother. I I think it'd be great for everybody to just get to know you a little bit better. And then finally, to wrap it up, uh, what is the best way for them to reach out to engage you? Absolutely. So as a reminder, I'm Max Schatzo. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Stark and Stark. In my spare time, you know, I love riding my Peloton, spending time with my family, riding, you know, riding my bike outdoors, playing golf. They, you know, there isn't much time for those things these days. We got two young kids, but always looking to get outside. So that's a little bit about me. If anyone is interested in getting in touch with me, you can always reach out by email, which is mshatzo, S-C-H-A-T-Z-O-W at stark-stark.com. Or you can reach me on my blog at Advisor Council, Advisor with an E, advisorcouncil.net. Please, please, please. And Max, just so you know, we're going to have links to all of those in the show notes so that people can just click on those and email you or, or subscribe to your blog. Please, if there is nothing else that you do from listening to our podcast today, just subscribe to advisorcouncil.net. I go on there just because I'm a nerd about this sort of stuff. I go on there really about every three or four weeks just to see what's going on because I was introduced to Max uh, through through a mutual friend of ours who was like, dude, you need to talk to this dude because he's freaking awesome. And you lived up to that, dude. This is a great, <laughs> this is super fun. I love, I love when, when I get to nerd out about something that I, I really am passionate about. Like I'm not such a huge passionate person about the investment component of, of financial services, but I love compliance. I know that sounds weird. And for all of you who are listening, we built everything we have at Proudmouth off of compliance. We've met with the largest compliant or the largest broker dealers, some of the largest RIAs to make sure that we're building systems internally so that you can truly be compliant so that you can rise above the noise and you can be your own loud. That's our goal here. And by working with somebody like Max, working with Stark and Stark, subscribing to the blog, asking good questions and finding out what's going on, you can have the confidence, which is truly what's needed to create your own custom content and own your marketplace. It's your professional duty to make sure that you have the infrastructure in place so that we can stop the main or the Wall Street misinformation about what's going on with people's personal investments and bring it to Main Street. And when you have the foundation of a great compliance back office, this idea of being able to outsource this stuff so that you can focus on what you need to focus on, which is providing amazing financial advice to your clients and getting the word out about who you are using somebody like Max and using the firm Stark and Stark can really, really help you. So Max, thanks for being on the show, brother. Thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. All right. If you have not subscribed to the podcast, make sure you click that subscribe now button below. That way, every time we come out with a new podcast, we'll show up directly on your listening device. And if you have any podcast ideas or you're like, dude, I, Matt, you should totally interview this person. All you have to do is email me, Matt at proudmouth.com. And for everybody at Stark and Stark and all of us here at Proudmouth, we'll see you on the other side of the mic very soon. Thanks for listening to the Top Advisor Marketing Podcast brought to you by Proudmouth. If you want to learn more about how you can be your own loud, visit our website, read our blog posts, attend our educational webinars, and sign up for our new Influence Accelerator Academy, where you too can learn how to truly be an influencer in your space. Have a wonderful day.